All right, so now we'll get started. Paul's back. Didn't want to rush you. But uh, as I mentioned, we're, you know, we'll, we'll wrap up uh, around nine-ish or so. Uh, again, feel free to stick around for 10, 15 minutes after that while we're cleaning up. Uh, besides that, let's get on to part two. Okay. All right, so uh, what we're going to do next now is I'm going to go through uh, some selected slides from my Java 8 course uh, on Streams API. Uh, you know, I was talking to some people uh, during the break, and uh, I think that, you know, what you could say historically with Java is that uh, if you look at going from Java 4 to Java 5, right, that was a big deal for Java developers because Java 5 was generics, right? And remember when we all started in Java, we had the object class and we passed that around and, and we had to be very careful to make sure we had our types right. Uh, when generics came along, you had to design your programs differently. You had to think more about types, and uh, and and you had to learn about the compiler error messages that went along with that. So it was a big deal to go from Java four to Java five. Not such a big deal to go from five to six, and 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 six to seven had some interesting things too. But Java eight is a big one, a very very big one, because when you have lambdas and strings and functional programming, it changes the way that you think and how you would write code, right? And so, you know, the, the code that, you, that a lot of you are writing right now is done in what's called an imperative style because that's what you were taught to do, just like I was taught to do that. But in, in functional programming, you program in more of a declarative style. And um, it's really interesting. Um, and, and that's what, you know, I'm going to show you some selected stuff here in this section for uh, working with the stream API and uh, we're also going to you'll also see some lambdas and stuff here too so that's why we talked about lambdas first and then we have a little more time here um, in this half to, to talk about these things so let's talk in general about what a stream is um, a misconception that a lot of beginners have when they get into Java 8 is they think that a stream is just uh, another kind of collection and that's not true right you know, we know what collections are, we know how to use those, we've been using collections since Java 5, but a stream is a different animal, it's not the same thing at all. Um, a stream is defined in Java 8 as a sequence of elements that come from some source, and they, then you, you uh, supply operations on that data, and then you can manipulate the collections of your data in a declarative way instead of an, uh, an imperative way. Uh, uh, when you when you don't use this stuff, you write a lot of loops and you do a lot of testing and looking for things. And the idea is, is that the stream API operations can do a lot of that for you. So when you get good at this stuff, you won't write that many loops anymore because the loops are being done for you by the stream APIs. And you're going to see that in a few minutes when we look at the example. The other thing that's really awesome is that you can, do, you can do a stream in a serial fashion or a parallel fashion. Now, serial means that you know, you're just going to go through and do it all basically with one CPU. But you guys know that you know, we have cores now in our laptops, right? My laptop right up here has eight cores, right? Wouldn't it be cool if I could do a stream and break it up so that the cores in my laptop could run these things in parallel? And I will show you tonight how to do that. And I'll show you the speed benefits for doing that. It's all coming up in my example. So I'm going to show you how to work with serial streams and parallel streams tonight with some of them. Okay, so the reason why people like streams is that they're declarative, they're more concise and readable, and they're composable. So you know you continue to use this builder pattern that we showed you with the cascaded dots. Now only instead of going from left to right with the cascading, you go down, see, and, and you'll see all that in a few minutes. And uh, again, people use streams because if you can parallelize something, you're going to get better performance because you're going to be leveraging the core processors that you have on your machine. I want to uh, uh, just say something really quickly, though, is that this is not as easy as it sounds. A lot of people think, oh, if I just slap parallel into a stream, it'll make everything go faster. And that's not always true. It depends on what you're doing. But I'll talk more about that when we get there. Okay, now the advantages of using streams are that the pipelining is going to chain these behaviors for you. You don't have to do any iterations at all. You don't have to write any loops. They're all done internally for you by the stream 
operations. Um, and then it's all lazily uh, done too, which means that you know it's uh, just because you write the code, it doesn't run right away until you launch it, right? So you could build a whole decision tree of things to do, and then you could say, okay, do it. But you know, it's not doing it piecemeal. It does it all at once after it's built. Um, you can there. It's a pipeline concept. So if you know about pipes from Linux, where you can pipe things together, it's kind of like that. Um, not exactly, but close to it. And um, you have intermediate stream operations that don't produce any results, but return new streams. And then you have terminal stream operations, which means that you know you uh, they they give you the answers back, and uh, that ends the stream operations themselves. Okay, so let's jump into this and show you what you can do with this. Okay. All right. I'm going to write some code here that is very very typical. Um, for, or I'm going to show you some code here that's very, very typical for these kinds of things that people do. All right, we're going to go back to the same old, same old here. Our list of people, okay, these three people and their ages, okay. Now, what's what I'm going to do here? I know you guys have written code like this, and you probably have a lot of this kind of uh, approach that you have done right now in the code that you work on every day. Okay, so I start off with a list of, of people and I, I'm gonna go and I'm going to uh, go into these lists and I'm going to end up with something that I'm interested in. So I start off with an empty array list. That, that's the beginning point, right? Because that's going to be um, storing um, some uh, a list of people that I'm interested in finding, okay? So the first thing that I do is I write a loop and I say for each person in the list, uh, go out and find all the people who are under 30 and put them in the person's list. Okay, so that's real easy to do. We all know how to do that. Um, you know, we're, we're looping through our person's list. That would be this guy right here, right there. And as we loop through it, we get we look at the age. If you're under 30, you get added into this list. Okay, now we have a list of people who are under 30, right? All right, now what are we going to do with that? Well, we want to sort it. So we go through, remember this is not Java 8, this is old Java code now, right? And you know, so you go through and use an anonymous class, see it right there, new comparator person, you override the compare method, you go in and you and call the compare for integer and you look at the ages. Okay, that's standard Java code, pre-Java 8. All right, now you've sorted the people who are under 30. Now what you'd like to do is you'd like to get their names. And when you get their names, you change the type from persons to strings, right? So now what we have to do is build another array list that is a list of strings. And now we go through the, the people that we found who are under 30 and we get their names and we put that in and finally we print it all out and there we go. Those are the people who are under 30, okay? And this is the code that I wrote to make that all happen, all right? Okay, so here's the same code in Java 8, right there. Here's the answer, it's exactly the same. Welcome to strings. All right, so what do you do? You take the same exact names of, of you take the same list that you had. See, here it is, there are the people, same as before, and you build a stream out of it. So you say dot stream. Okay, now you see how the dots are being cascaded? See, see how the dot starts here and then it starts here and down there? So this is uh, an idiom that you do in, in streams at Java 8 is you go down the page and you put dots in front of them so it's easy to read. So without knowing what's going on here at all, you can pretty much read this and see what I'm doing, right? What, take a guess, what do you think the filter does? It goes into the stream of people that are going down the pipeline and it's only letting the people through who are under 30. If you're over 30, you don't go to the next down the pipe. Make sense? Okay, and after you do the filter, then you sort it, right? And once again, you know, we're using the comparator class here, but we're using it um, in a little bit different way because now we're using a method reference. I talked about that before the break. Okay, so now you sort the people who are under 30. 
The map is a way of saying, I want to take all the people in the pipeline and I want to, I want to call a function with those, with those people so that I can get some information out of it. And that you can, the method reference tells you that the, function, the method you're calling is the, the name of the person. Super readable, right? So now you are filtering all the people who are under 30, you're sorting that list, and you are getting their names. And all you have to do now, this is the best part, is you collect it, dot collect, into a new list. And that list will be a list of strings because you called get name, and get name gives you back a string, and you're done. And that's it. Aha, uh -huh, good question. I uh, don't have it here, so we have to show you that in the program. It's actually a static method that belongs in the java.util.library, uh, but that's that's where that is. And so, you know, it looks like it's hanging out there by itself, but it's actually a static method. And and then uh, and you can import static methods, right? Good. Yeah, you, you have to import the static method to do that. I'll show you in the code in a second. Now, I think that it would be instructive for you. Uh, I have this same example in um, section three in my refactoring, and the, here I have both of the of, of, of the code in one slide, so you can kind of see it better here on what we did here to uh, to make this work or not. So what we did here that's interesting is this is called an imperative style. This is what most Java programmers do today: is they write all of this code where they have to declare empty array lists, they have to go find things themselves, they have to write the loops, uh, they have to add them to the list, they have to, uh, they have to do things like sort and create anonymous classes, and they end up with all of the code down below, but underneath it, I have exactly the same thing, only it is being done with strings, and this is called the declarative style. Okay? All right, so let's compare and contrast a few things so you can see a little bit more about what's going on, right? Okay, this is a lambda. You know, we, you know what that is, right? That's an anonymous function that returns true or false based on a person's age uh, if they're under 30, okay? That code is right here. Same code, right? Except that we had to write a loop and we had to do an if statement, see? And we don't have to do any of that here because the filtering is doing it for us. Okay. The anonymous class that's built from the comparator interface has a compare function, and we had to write all of this code to do it, or maybe get our IDE to generate it for us. Sometimes you can get IDs to do that. Here, there is a new uh, static method in the comparator class that was added uh, to in Java 8, so that when you give it a method reference, person, colon, colon, get age, it will generate all that code for you up above. So what's actually happening here is that this code that you're seeing right there is actually generating all of that code for you behind the scenes. You don't have to write all that stuff. And then the map is, you know, like I said, is uh, applying, uh, is taking um, a, a, an object out of the stream and then calling this function with it and then storing the, date, the return type for you. And then you collect all that together in, in a list. And, and that's pretty cool. Okay, so everybody see what, what's going on and see how the declarative style is, I claim, easier to read. There's less clutter um, and there's no loops. I didn't write a single loop. I didn't even use an if statement. And yet I'm doing both of those things here, except I'm not doing it, right? The stream API is doing it for me. You really like this when you start using it a lot because, you know, you don't, you're not going to be writing a lot of boilerplate code like you saw above. Right. So the way this works is that when you when you build this thing, absolutely nothing happens until you get to a terminal operation like collect, and then all of the code runs. So it's like a lazy construction, basically. You know, you know, you know about lazy, right? You know that that means that you set something up, but you don't actually uh, do it until you are asked to do it. And doing the filter and the sorted and the map, none of that executes until you do the collect. As soon as you do the collect, then all of this code runs. It just sets everything up internally to, to basically go through this kind of an, an algorithm, but it's doing it all for you so you don't have to write uh, hardly any code. How does that debug? 
breakpoint. No, no breakpoints. You use peak. Peak. Dot peak. You put slap a little dot peak right in the middle of the stream, and then you can see what's going down the stream. It's really easy. You see it now. What's that? You see it where? Uh, well, you can tell it to dump it to the console, or you can have it go to a file. Yeah, it's really cool. So that's what what I would do. I wouldn't I wouldn't use a, a regular debugger here because this is a different concept, isn't it? It's not like this is this is a declarative approach as opposed to imperative, where with an imperative approach you can use a debugger to step through it and look at certain variables and things like that. But here, you know, you don't have to do that. You're at a higher level, and the stream data is, is is being processed here that's what you're interested in is what's coming out of filter and what's going into sort what's coming out of sorted and going into map you stick a dot peak in there and then you can see what it is and then you can see and by the way if you get the types wrong if you uh, it, you'll get you get compilation errors and the messages are pretty good um, you know some of them are a little obscure you have to get used to that but uh, you know if you if you don't wire it together right it's it won't do something bad it just won't compile and you know you'll you'll be able to figure it out okay hmm it is different it's it is it, it's not um, I don't from what I remember uh, in talking to people and reading about that is that it is about the same it's not less and it's not a whole lot more either but I think it's a little bit more to set this all up but nobody seems to really care about that because it's worth it being able to because you can put these things together so quickly when you're used to it you don't have to you know take a lot of time to write the code um, and of course you know when you move to parallel stuff it's definitely worth it because you know Making something parallel is so easy with this approach, and you know if you don't, if you are doing it the old way, uh, you know you have to use the fork join pool. If you know what that is, that's a lot of work and very very tricky to use in Java Seven. And and the parallel streams is built on top of the fork join pool that was that's in Java Seven. So you know again you're leveraging a lot of cool things there. Okay, so uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to. Uh, talk a little bit more about filter and map and collect, right? Because you know, you guys have a lot of you guys haven't seen this before, and um, I'm going to show you some more examples of these now, so you can see a little bit more about how they work individually, and then we'll look at a couple more examples uh, where you're doing the same kind of thing. Okay, so let's go and uh, and look at the filtering here. Oh, you know, I think your question is, what happens if uh, if you call a method and it throws an exception? Isn't that your question? An error? No, you don't have to worry about a null in, in, in this world because nobody returns uh, native pointers with streams. They all return the optional. Yeah, I mean things like that are going to break, but but what 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 I was going to say was that it, I mean, if you have a null in there, which you shouldn't have, but if you do, then you know that this will be a problem. But what the stream operators do is that they don't return native pointers like like we see with a lot of APIs in Java. They return an optional object which wraps the pointer, and then you can write the code to determine whether the pointer is null or not, and then everything, and then you can do whatever you need to do. And I don't, I don't have time to go into the, those examples for that. That's, that's more, what you're asking about is error handling that goes along with this stuff, right? But uh, it is doable and, um, you know, there are techniques for doing that. They're all built on the optional class, okay? Okay, uh, let's see. Well, we, let's go talk, let's go look at some filtering right now. That uh, will be in section two for that. So let's go look at um, filtering. Here we go. Okay, so this is this is just a slide that shows you 
uh, how to use a filter. Filter is one of the easiest ones in the stream library to use because it takes a predicate argument. You know what a predicate is? That's a, that's a lambda that returns a boolean, true or false. So uh, we can use this. Uh, we, all we have to do is make up a lambda that will return true or false and pass it to filter and put it into a stream and then we can decide what will, will continue down the stream or will be um, um, pulled out. And um, here is an example of where we can, we can do that. Um, uh, once again, I'm sticking with the same list of people here and I have this inside of this program and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to say, let's go find everybody whose last name is Jones. So I write a method called get last name and I pass it a list of people and I give it the name, the last name that I'm interested in. Okay? So when I write this code, I can use a string. Okay, instead of loop. Once again, I'm not writing any loops here. So I uh, take my list that comes in to the get last name and I create a string out of it. And then I use a filter with a lambda expression that says take a person that is coming down in the pipe and uh, call their last name and see if it's equal to the name that, you know, that was given to you. In this case, that would be Jones. See, what I did here was I wrote a get last name static method that can be used with any list of people and it will find anybody's last name, right? So that's a real general thing. And uh, it only works for, for persons here, right? It's not totally generic, but um, you know, I, that lambda expression right there is what I use to filter out people who, all, whose last name is whatever I was given. And then I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna collect it into a list. And when I collect it into a list, then that means that when this returns, it will give me back a list of people, which is that type right there. And when I run this, I get these two people, uh, their last names are both Jones, okay? So you can see that, you know, the predicate that you put here could be anything. I've already shown you, I can say, filter all the people who are over 40, uh, filter all the people who are um, teenagers, uh, anything that, is true or false basically is all I have to do here and by the way I didn't I didn't say this uh, in in the beginning when we talked about lambdas but did you guys notice that I don't even need to put the type for P right here who we'll figure how, do, how does the compiler know what type P is right because the generics for the stream that is applied to people is a person type so this is type inference in Java 8, which is all over the place, where the compiler will figure out the types for you, and you don't have to sit there and go, oh, is this a string, is this a person? You know, sometimes we have to, to fight that, right? And so, you know, we could, in the Lambda, we could put in, 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 in where the P is, I could have parens, and I could say person space P. That would compile just fine. But when you start using this stuff, you realize, I don't need to do that, because the compiler knows that P is a person. And, uh, and therefore it will call this method and everything will work great. Okay, so, that, uh, so that's, a, that's a, another example of the filter. Here's another one. This one has a one called distinct. And uh, let's do a different example right now where we're not using people. Uh, let's make up an array of numbers, okay? Just some random two and three digit numbers, some single digit ones too, right? An array of nums. And let's build a stream out of that array. See how I did that there? You could build a stream out of uh, pretty much anything in Java 8. So there's my array. Uh, it's actually a native array. Uh, and I'll build a stream out of it. And uh, what am I doing in the filter here? What am I looking for? Two digit numbers. And by the way, you know, you just make up a variable name here n, x, whatever you want but it, it represents one of these numbers that's coming into the pipeline. So the first time it'll be a three, and then it'll be an 83. And what, get, what goes on through the pipe, what, what comes out of filter are only two digit numbers because the predicate is saying, I'm only, you know, if it's true, then it will go down the stream and continue on. If it's two, uh, between 10 and 99 inclusive, if it's not, then it doesn't go through. And then what do you think distinct does? Throws out the duplicates. 
See how the declarative style is so much easier to read and understand? I mean, I didn't even have to tell you guys what distinct did because you, you knew that it would be saying, uh, and you know, there's also a limit. So you could say, I only want the first 10 or the first five or the first hundred. So you can put a limit in there too. These things are really easy to use. You throw them in there, everything works and it's great. And by the way, there is a for each that you could use in a stream and that will generate a loop for you. And, uh, and what, what do you think I'm doing in the for each loop with each element that comes out that is a two digit number? Answer, printing it. System dot out print line, only I'm using a method reference there, right? But the for each right there is a terminal operation. This is an example where I'm not collecting the results in a list, I'm printing them out. See, so there they are, 83 and 45. Those are both two digit numbers. And notice I had put two 45s in the list, but only one of them made it through because I had distinct. And what would happen if I commented out the distinct right here? What would the answer be? I would have two 45s. Oh, when I did the arrays as list? Uh, yeah, I'm doing it differently, aren't I? Right, so here, um, well, you know what arrays as list does, right? You know, this is a, a nice way of creating a, um, is creating a list, populating a list as an array. So you, it's a static method as list in the arrays class and you can populate it with people. And uh, at, at that point I have a list and then I can, um, uh, and then I pass the list to this method as people and there is where I call stream. But I can also call stream on a built-in array in John 8. And that's what I'm doing right here. So the, and I'm doing that with arrays.stream. So um, I, these, are, these are just multiple ways of creating stream objects. Um, you have to call, if you're going to create a stream from a built-in array, you have to call the static stream method in the arrays class. Otherwise, you can use the arrays as and, and And the different ways you can create streams are all in my course. Um, so it's good that you picked that up. But yeah, it is different. And that's what happens when you jump around a little bit like this. Is if you guys were all in my course, it would all you know, flow and you guys would see things um, a little bit better because we're jumping around a bit here. Okay, everybody good with filter? Filter's pretty easy, okay? Now the next one to look at is map. Now map is a little bit tricky. So let's go look at this one now. This one's a little harder for people to, to understand sometimes um, because you saw me put a map you know, in the stream, right? Okay, so the first thing you learn is that map has an argument and that would be a function, functional interface. That would be uh, one argument uh, that you pass to the function and it returns something back. But the key to understanding a map is the verb transforms. That's really the way I look at a map. A map is a way of transforming the data that you have in a screen, okay, to new values. And what you want to do is when you when you take a map, when you use a map in it, what you're doing is you're taking objects that are in the stream and you're applying a map to them and you uh, can get new values that come out and you can also change the data type. So this is very interesting and uh, here is a program that shows you that. In fact, I'm going to run this program and play with it a little bit. So here we go. By the way, you asked about the to list. Uh, remember you, you said, what what is this guy right here? here here's the answer. Import static java.util.stream.collectors to list. That's where that comes from. Okay, that was a good question, and that's the answer. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and uh, get away from people for right now, and let's work with some numbers. Uh, let's go back to what we had arrays.as list, and let's just build a list of integers with 20, 50, and 80. Okay, all right, so now we have a list, and we can call string. Okay, so let's call the stream with the list. All right, now, do I have to tell you what map does? What do you think map's doing? It's a lambda, right? But what do you think it's doing? 
you know, T represents the data that's coming down the pipe, down the, the stream, and into the map. And that would be the numbers 20, 50, and 80. So what do you think map is doing? It's just adding 10 to each one of the numbers. But it's doing it for you without you writing a loop. See, because, you know, you guys could all do this. You could write a loop, and you could loop through the array, and you could add 10 to 20, and 10 to 50, and 10 to 80. But the map is going to do it for you. So the numbers come in as D, and they come out as D plus 10. And then when they, when they come out as D plus 10 from the map, then I use a print line to print them out. Okay? So you get 30, 60, and 90. No, it didn't. It didn't. That's a very good observation. It did not put them in the map. But we can make it put it in the map. So why don't we do that right now? Well, actually, uh, let's do the rest of it, and then we'll modify this one to show you how to do that. Let's take another example, uh, Manny, Mo, and Jack as strings. And what I would like to do is I would like to make them all uppercase. Manny, Mo, and Jack, all uppercase letters. Okay? So build an array, uh, a list, uh, Manny, Mo, and Jack. Build a stream out of it. And now what is the map doing to each element in the string, which is a string? Called making them uppercase. That's a method reference. See how method references are cool? Because they're really readable. And, uh, you know, I could put a lambda in there, but, you know, the lambdas are, you know, are not necessary. We know what we're doing there. We're calling the two uppercase uh, from the string class, and we're doing it on each one of the strings that come through. And then I'm going to collect it into a, uh, a list at the end, and that will be a list of strings, which is what I started with. And now, this is important. I started with the list and I'm assigning it to the list. So therefore, I have modified it. The list now is no longer Manny, Mo, and Jack lowercase. It's now Manny, Mo, and Jack uppercase. Everybody see that? Where I have list here and list here? Because when I collect it, after it's been transformed, I'm going to update it by putting it back into the list reference. This example is like the terminal. Correct. Now uh, you get an error. You, compiler. Yep. Yeah, you have to have a terminal operation at the end because because it, uh, it's a decision tree. You know, it's a whole bunch of stuff that's generated and it built it all, and then you didn't tell it to execute it, so it's, it's going to give you an error. So you have, and the re, and the error that you would get is that uh, you know the what you get back here from the collect the, the lit is is assigned to this, and if you leave it off, then the map would be the return value, and the types wouldn't match. You get a compiler error, not a runtime. So if you don't build, forget do something, it'll tell you, uh, you know, get an error, and, and we'll see how that works. Right. Let's play with this program here so you can learn a little bit more about it. Let's go into um, section two now and uh, pull out the map elements program. That's the one we just looked at here. Okay. And in here it is. So you can see um, you can see that you know this is the output that we just uh, showed you. And of course, the output I always put into my programs anyway, so you can see them, right? Okay. Now. Um, you know, it, if you decided to not do the for each, right? So let's comment that out. And you know, right away, you know, red lines, right? You know, it, this is telling you that something is right. And let, let's collect this into, um, And now everything seems uh, seems pretty good, right? But you know, when I run this program, um, what's going to happen? Nothing changed. Uh, well, the Manny, Mo, and Jack changed, but the twenty, fifty, and eighty did not change. Why not? What did I forget to do? Remember what I did down below? I need to do this, right?
because what I did was I generated, you know, the stream executed and it built all the stuff and then I threw it away. But if I put it back into numbers, then it will, uh, it should work exactly the same that uh, Manny Mo and Jack. See, now it's 30, 60, and 90. See, so, uh, but once again, you know, uh, if I if if I do something wrong here, for example, you know, I I don't do the collect. I do a for each. That's a terminal operation, just like collect. But you know, the the error message is telling you incompatible types, right? Because the, you know, the for each is not going to give back the type that's going to match what we have here, right? Um, so, so you know, you'll you'll get lots of good compiler help here, especially in an IDE like this, uh, so that you can make sure that you wire these things together correctly and, and all of that. Okay, so everybody see how the map works? Right, pretty cool, pretty easy to use too. And once again, if you're getting the feeling that when you read this code that it's pretty easy to read, that's part of the attraction to this kind of programming, declarative programming that, you know, because you're not, your eyes are not cluttered by for loops and if statements. See, you know, none of that's happening here. It's just, this is what I want to do, right? I want to do a map, I want to do a filter, I want to look for such distinct. It's called declarative programming. And this is what, you know, what functional programming is promoting and this is what Java 8 is allowing us to do now at this point. Okay, now let's talk a little bit more about the collectors, okay? You know, we've only shown you how to collect the data into a list. Uh, is that all you can do in Java 8? Oh no, there's a lot more you can do. So let's go to a slide uh, that tells you a lot more about this stuff too. All right, now there's a whole part of this stuff that's called the collectors. And this is a mini lecture in itself, right? But the collectors, will allow you to do all kinds of interesting things other than simply collecting the results and putting them in a list. That's all you guys have seen. So what else can you do with the collectors? Well, look at this. You can do, uh, you can count the number of elements that you have uh, found in a stream. You can add them together. You can do uh, uh, statistics. You can do uh, averaging. I, I mean, they've made up these things in the APIs that they figure people are gonna use which would be to uh, calculate the average of a bunch of numbers, for example, and that sort of thing. This is the ones that I really like, the max by and the min by. Find the maximum number of elements, the minimum number of elements, and then they have um, you know, the ability to do what's called joining, or you can do concatenations of elements, and you can do reductions. So let's show you some, some simple examples of these things, just so you get the idea that the collectors are not just collecting the data into the list. All right, let's go back to the people again. Same old, same old. Here are our three people. Uh, once again, I'll show you how we can find all the people. We want to find out how many people in our list are over 25 years old. How many people? Okay. All right, that's easy. List.stream, do a filter, so you get people over 25. Do a collect, but don't put it in a list, call counting. What are you going to get back when you call counting? An, an integer, right? Not a list, right? And it's actually a long, right? But that's the answer. So the return from a flood, the dot flag is a long count, and if you print that out, then the answer will be two. There are two people in my list who are under, I mean, over 25. So that's another thing that we can do. Okay, here's another one. Build the list, and this time call the collector and add all the people's ages together. The answer is 89. A little weird that you'd do that, but you might be interested in, in that. Um, that adds up all the, you know, that adds up these three numbers right here 28, 25, and 36. That all adds up to 89. But notice that I'm doing that in the collector by by calling the summing int uh, method and uh, well the summing int is is um, is, is uh, being passed to the collector but but I'm also telling it what I want to sum and that would be the ages that are returned back from the get age. Now uh, 89 would not be real practical right but this is this would be you might want to know what's the average age of all the people that I'm working with in my list 
the answer is 29.67, okay? And it's the same idea. You can call the collector, and there is an averaging int that you can use. Once again, look how easy that is to read. When you read that code, you know exactly what's going on. You know that you're calculating an average, and you know how you're doing it by a person's age. That's not the reference. It's really, really clear. Now these are my favorites, right? You know, the maximum age, what's the oldest person in my list? Um, this is uh, very, very nice and very useful. Max buy and min buy. So uh, what you can do is uh, make up a person comparator that will say I want to uh, look at people's ages and then you build a stream and you collect it by calling max buy with the person comparator and then when you call the dot get, you get back a uh, person at that point, and that will be the oldest person in the list. And if you put min by in here, M-I-N-B-Y, then you would find the youngest person in the list. Once again, please notice I'm not writing any loops, I'm not using any if statements, and I have no algorithms here. All being done by streams, method references, uh, and collectors. Is there a way to match the end of the stage Yes, you can, you can, you can do them at the same time. And to do that, you have to chain them together in a certain way. But you can, you can apply more than one to a collector if you want to. So they, you know, and then these are very interesting constructions, right? Because they are, again, query type things that we're used to writing a lot of Java code to happen. And I'm not writing hardly any code here at all to make this work. That's pretty cool. Question on the method references. Are these collectors? You mean what? You mean what? What it? What is this right here? Yeah, a method reference is it just a lambda under the hood, right? It, it's an, yep, right, that's what it is. And you know, I could take out this person cold call and get age and I could put a lambda in there that, that, and, it would, and it's really the same thing, right? But that's what, you know, I'm passing code as arguments to functions so that that code can be used to perform some kind of an operation for me. That's what functional programming is all about. Okay, so I have one more example to show you guys. Uh, I think you'll really like this. Um, this, this is a fun one and uh, people always like this and I had a lot of fun doing it. I'm going to show you now in the, in the time that we have left how to do a parallel stream and how to use the core processors in your machines. Um, I have done this in a Java 7 with the fork join tool and it's an ungodly mess. Have you guys ever have you guys used the fork join tool? It's not easy and you're going to be blown away about how, uh, how they have done this now so that the whole fork join framework is being done under the hood for you now by using parallel streams. Okay, so why, do we, why are we interested in this? Well, because we want to take our stream elements and we want to break them up into chunks and say, I've got this big stream that I'm doing, let's put part of it in this core, part of it in this core, and part of it in this core, and let's run them all in parallel. And therefore, I would be able to uh, increase my performance if I did that, right? Um, so there's threads going on behind the scenes and you don't have to write one line of thread code. It's all being done for you under the hood. Multiple cores are being used for you. All the thread issues are handled for you again under the hood. And again, it's all using the fork join framework from Java 7 to make this all happen. Okay, so there are uh, there's a parallel method that you can call, and there and you, so you can make a serial uh, sequential stream into a parallel one, and you can also go the other direction. And there's also an unordered one that uh, that I'm not going to talk about right now. Okay, now the first thing that you should know about is there's a really cool API in Java 8, and here it is. Um, you're welcome to run this if you you know if you have Java 8 installed on your system. Uh, it's, uh, call uh, run runtime.getruntime.available processors, and this will tell you how many cores you have uh, that Java will be able to use on your system. And on my system, and I'll show you my program in a minute, it will say eight, okay, because that's how many cores I have here on my Mac. 
Okay, now before, well, I'll talk more about, about when you can use this and when, when we not, uh, when we go through the example. But so we'll come back and talk about the fact that parallel is not always going to improve the performance of your code. It depends on what you're doing. And you need to use parallel correctly. So, you know, for me, it was a bit of a challenge to come up with an example that would show people that this stuff really works. So I came up with this, and it's pretty, it was pretty fun. Um, do you guys remember what a perfect number is? From school or anything? Do you remember what a perfect number is? That's okay. A perfect number is a number that if you take the divisors of that number and add them all together, it is that number. For example, 6 is a perfect number because it's divisible by 3, by 2, and by 1. And when you add those all together, you get 6. Okay? Uh, 28 is a perfect number because it's divisible by 14, by 7, by 4, 2, and 1. And you add all those numbers up and you get 28. What's interesting about perfect numbers, and I didn't even know this uh, until I actually wrote the program that I'm going to show you, but if you go out and you Google a uh, list of perfect numbers, um, it's pretty interesting. So let's just show you this before we show you the code and everything. All right, here's your list of perfect numbers. There's 6, there's 28, the next one is 496, the next one is 812A. Check this out. Euclid knew about these in the 4th century BC. In fact, Euclid knew that 8,128 was a perfect number, uh, you know, four centuries before um, the BC. The next one is really interesting. It was discovered uh, it's in a medieval manuscript in the year 1456, probably by a monk in a basement. Right? And that number is this one right here. That is a perfect number. And let's just cut to the chase, right? The next one was discovered in 1500s and then 1700s. Well, you know, let's just see where we're at today. Uh, here we are in the 80s, here we are in the 90s. Now look what's going on here. The perfect number eventually can't fit in this column, right? So that's what the dot, dot, dots mean. So they give you the digits, right? So when you get up to uh, the year 2000, we're at 8 million digits now for this one. And these are the people that are doing this, a lot of the same people, these people have more time on their hands than we do. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. But they're using supercomputers, aren't they? Right? Well, let's see where we're at right now. Okay, the, another perfect number was discovered uh, last year, 2016, 44 million digits, and, uh, and it looks like it's the same guys. And I will tell you right now, there is some machine running that's computing the next one. And uh, we may find out next year, but I doubt it. it. It might be three or four years from now. But anyway, I didn't know anything about this when I wrote this program. Uh, I just discovered this by accident one day, so I thought I would show it to you. But this is a great example to show people how parallel can be used and also uh, with benchmarks. So watch what I'm going to do now. I'm going to implement this with my example. What's that? Uh, that would be for a mathematician to, to say, I think. I think the answer theoretically is yes. I don't know about that. That's a good question he's asking. Are there an infinite number of perfect numbers? I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not a mathematician, so I wouldn't know. But, um, you know, you could Google that, but that doesn't mean that whatever you find out is true. Okay, so let's go see what we can do with this now. Oops, I waited too long. My virtual machine is, no, I don't need that right now anyway, but. Okay, so here we go. All right, now the code, the Java code to do a perfect number is easy, right? There it is, right? Let's write an iterative perfect function a method, right? Give it a number and it returns a boolean. It's either a perfect number or it isn't. Well, that's easy, right? You make up a perfect called uh, perfect and you set it to zero. You set up a for loop to go through from one to the number. You do a, a, a mod function on that number. If it's equal to zero, you take that number and you put it in the running sum. And when you're all done, if the running sum is the number you start with, it's a perfect number. Ready to agree? Okay, now, 
what's interesting about this function, this method here, is that it is CPU bound. That's important. Because when you have something that's CPU bound, then you can put it into core processors, right? I'm not doing any I.O. I'm not doing anything that would cause uh, delays to happen. It is a pure uh, CPU bound type thing, right? And of course, when I run this with the number six, it comes back true. But you know, six is not what's interesting. You know, I, what I want to do is put one of those big numbers that you saw on the table in here, and then uh, show you what's going on. So, so this is uh, the iterative perfect uh, um, method that I wrote that will determine whether a number that you give it is perfect or not. So now I'm going to write a sequential stream implementation. Okay. And, uh, and what I'm going to do here is um, I'm going to uh, go through and generate uh, all the numbers here, and then I'm going to uh, see if, it, uh, if it's true or not. Now, I'm using a reduction in here, and I didn't go through the reduction, but you can see that what it's doing is it's adding up all of the numbers. So what I'm doing here is I'm actually implementing this algorithm right here with the stream, and um, and I'm adding I'm adding them all up with the mod function in the lambda. So so this code is easy to understand, but it's imperative code, and and it uses a loop that I wrote. Now I'm going to write it with strings, and this will do the same thing and give me back either true or false based on whether the running sum is equal to the number that I started with, all right? Now watch this. I'm gonna take this code right here and I'm going to make one change to it in the next one. I'm going to put parallel in there. Now what do you think parallel does when you put it inside of a string? It does the fork join. It takes the stream and it breaks it up into chunks and it finds out how many core processors you have, and it puts the chunks in the core processors and runs them all in parallel, and it gathers them all for you. One word does this, parallel. And it works great in this example because I have a purely CPU-bound operation that I'm doing, right? So this code is exactly the same in sequential perfect as it is in parallel perfect. The only thing that's different is that I slapped the dot parallel in there, and that makes it run with core processors all in parallel. I'm going to do a benchmark right now. Okay, so here's my benchmark. Um, I just wrote this really quickly. It's not a big deal. Uh, it's called get time, right? And I'm using a uh, the function interface at Java 8. So I go through and I say what is that? and I say what's the uh, I get what's the current nano time that is here, and I grab it there, and then I call the function. Uh, that would be the sequential one and the iterative, so I'm going to benchmark them together. And, uh, and then after I'm done with that, I will call nano time again, and I'll subtract off the one that I had before I ran the function, and I'll divide it by a million, and I'll get milliseconds. And I'm going to do this 10 times, and I'm going to take the smallest one that I find. The fastest one. Okay, let's fire this up. There it is. And I'm going to take that big number, 33,550,336. That's in the, the table. That's a perfect number. And I'm going to do it iteratively, which was the first code that I showed you. I'm going to do it sequentially, which is a stream. And then I'm going to do it in parallel. So you guys see what's going on here, right? Here's what I'm doing, right? Iterative perfect is this guy right here. This is the standard Java code that you would write uh, in an in imperative style, right? A for loop, very easy to read. That's what that, that's what that does. The sequential perfect does it with streams. Same thing. The parallel perfect uses streams, but it uses cores. And what I can do with my test harness is I can run these all with the, in the, with the harness by passing in the method reference for each one of these. Iterative perfect, sequential perfect, parallel perfect. And those are the numbers. And here 
here are the results. Pretty interesting. The iterative, the sequential, by the way, doesn't beat the iterative. In case you were wondering, it's about the same, right? But look at the parallel. That's your cores. And you know what? I'm going to run it for you right now, so you can see that this is real. So you let's do that. <laughs> by the way, I put in the next one that was from this, uh, and uh, you know, I, I I I waited for about five minutes, and then I went out in the kitchen. Put it around and I came back and finally I think it uh, overflowed or something. So the next one up from this in the table, yeah, we, it's real big. Um, okay, so uh, let's just run this program for you right now and then uh, I think we'll be pretty much done. Um, so this program is called Parallel Streams. Oh, I guess, oh yeah, I modified this, didn't I? So let's go ahead and save it. Okay, parallel streams is right here. Okay, and this is the code that I just showed you. Okay, so here again is the uh, old way of doing it where you write the loop and the logic yourself. This is the sequential one. This is the parallel one that has this in it as well. This is the test harness, and here we go. Look how long it's taking. Iterative time, 313 milliseconds. Sequential time, 321, parallel 83. And did you notice what I printed out at the beginning? Number of processors, eight. See that right there? And that that's and you can do that on your machine too by making that call right there. That's what, what in Java 8, that will tell you how many cores you're running on your program. And when you write a program like this, I would recommend that you do that because I can take this program and run it on, I could run it on this guy over here and, and I, I doubt if he has, I don't know, maybe he has more cores than I do, but, but maybe not. But at any rate, um, you know, and this is pretty consistent, you know, because when I run it multiple times, the behavior is pretty much the same. It's right around 300 milliseconds for both the iterative and the sequential, but a big, big boost in speed for the, uh, for the parallel. Again, because I'm, I'm using cores. And, and isn't it awesome, I think, that to make that all happen, and I have worked with the fork join pool, so I can really appreciate that, and you guys that have done that too. The whole thing is happening with one word that, that I'm putting into a stream. That makes it all happen behind, behind the scenes. But please remember that you, know, you have to have the right problem to make this work effectively, right? You can't just slap parallel into any stream and say, oh, it's going to speed things up. In fact, there's lots of examples out there where it slows you down, actually. So you do have to pay attention to some of those things. Okay, so um, that's pretty much all I wanted to show you. I ran a little bit over, sorry. But um, hopefully you guys got to see a little bit about uh, how you can use this stuff. And, and it really works great. And, uh, you know, thanks for coming. Uh, as we tear down, chat for a few minutes. But uh, if there is any pizza left over, I haven't checked myself. Feel free to take whatever you want. Uh,